Tristan is an atheist, feminist, vegan, democrat, consistent life activist, LGBTQIA ally, and founder and executive director of Pro-Life San Francisco. Um, she's also a co-leader of Secular Pro-Life and serves on the board of Rehumanize International. Teresa was awarded top on-air talent of her class from Specs Howard School of Broadcast Arts and has experience in corporate business and team management with a number of Fortune 500 companies. Um, she speaks to pro-life groups throughout the nation on secular and millennial outreach specifically, and her efforts have been featured in major media outlets um, such as NBC News Now, The Huffington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, NPR, and many more. Um, she currently resides in the Tenderloin with her two cats, um, and we're very glad to have her today. Um, so come on up. Yeah, let's give her a warm round of applause. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming to class today. I really appreciate it. I know abortion, talking about it, listening to it, has got to be one of the biggest buzzkills on earth. I wake up every day and I deal with it, so I am very, very grateful um, that you guys took the time to come to class today. Um, like was mentioned earlier, I am an atheist. I, I'm a vegan. I'm an LGBTQIA ally and the founder and executive director of Pro Life San Francisco. We are a millennial-led grassroots activist organization operating in arguably one of the most pro-choice cultures in America. Uh, we seek to educate the community on the topic of abortion, to connect pregnant people with resources, and to resist the influence of the abortion industry here in our community. And um, I chose this as the cover slide. Uh, it says, everyone loves someone who's had an abortion because this is very true. And um, abortion, you know, it's a, it's a philosophical debate, um, it's a material debate, but it's also very personal for just about every single person. One in four uh, people who have wombs will become pregnant at some point in their life and have an abortion. So I think it's really unlikely that abortion hasn't directly um, or indirectly affected just about everybody in this room. And I wanna be sensitive to that. Um, and I want you guys to know also that I had uh, a pregnancy scare at 17, and I 100% was definitely going to have an abortion. Um, and it turned out that I wasn't pregnant and I didn't have an abortion, but I know what decision I would have made. So I want you guys to know that I'm not here to judge anyone and that that's not what the pro-life position is about. Uh, this is about exploring the truth of the situation and confronting ideas that maybe are uncomfortable for us. Um, I think it's really important, even in my activism, I feel a responsibility to the conclusions that I've come to, but I have to always approach, especially the abortion issue, uh, with the knowledge that I could be wrong about it. And I'm asking you guys to kind of do the same thing. You know, it, it's absolutely possible through our own biases and through our own experiences that we've developed a, a position on abortion um, that, you know, we may change at some point. I know I did. So, um, is there a clicker, by the way? So I want to tell you a little bit about my story, because it's like, how the heck did you end up here? And I ask myself that every morning when I wake up and look in the mirror. Um, this is a picture of me just last week at the Democratic debate in Atlanta. I'm holding, holding a 22-week-old um, fetal model, actually, which I did bring, and I, I can pass it around so you guys can take a look at it. Um, and my journey started, uh, as a pro-choice youth. Uh, I argued for the choice position in my debate class in high school. I argued for choice um, in my speech class. And like I said, I, I had a pregnancy scare. I was pro-choice. And a political conservative, sorry about that. Um, but he had very pro-life opinions and he would challenge my opinions about animal rights. And he would say, how can you care about the dolphins if you don't care about unborn children being killed in the womb? And I thought, what unborn children? It's just a clump of cells. Um, and he really went out of his way to show me images of uh, prenatal children in utero um, and videos of abortion procedures. And I was shocked. And I, I was uh, sure in that moment that, okay, abortion is probably something wrong. It's probably something bad. But there's a lot of really, really bad things happening out there in the world. And I'm really not doing anything about that. And they're not nearly as morally complicated as something like pregnancy. So, you know, I'm just, I, babies go to heaven when they die. I'll just pray about it and, and, and hope for the best. And then over the next few years, I lost my faith um, altogether. Um, and a lot of it was really centered around this idea of what's right and wrong and what's good and evil. And I just was pretty much, I came to the understanding that God was either a monster or didn't exist. And I know that other people don't share those opinions, but that's just my story and that's how I felt about it. 
Um, but it caused me to rethink about abortion in a way that I never had before. I thought of my life as something willed by God, and there was a purpose for my life, and anybody who didn't make it, well, you know, we'll pray about them, but they'll go to heaven. It's, there just wasn't a will for that life. But then I saw my own life as like, oh my gosh, I'm here just because, you know, four billion years of evolution have occurred. I have one in four trillion chance of popping into an existence. Who has the right to take that from me and why? And so I went down this rabbit hole of why, what makes killing wrong, and you know, I was in my new atheist mindset. I was confused about a lot of things about right and wrong, and I kept coming to this position and thinking, wow, I think I'm having some pro-life opinions, but what do I do about that? I live in San Francisco, I'm a liberal, this doesn't make sense, I just won't tell anyone. So I basically just kept it a secret for quite a while until I um, saw a friend of mine posting on a page called Secular Pro-Life on Facebook. And I thought, oh my gosh, there are more people like me out there. And I found out there's about 12 million non-religious pro-lifers in America, according to Gallup. Um, and I was introduced to um, atheist, well, atheist ideas um, like Christopher Hitchens, or people who have ideas like Christopher Hitchens, who you may not know. He, he might be too old for you guys. He's passed now. But he was a prominent atheist um, in the early 2000s, a prominent atheist th thinker. And he held some very pro-life opinions that were pretty impactful um, to me in the early days of my advocacy. So I got some keyboard courage, and I started having debates online and getting more into the, the arguments. And, and then before long, Secular Pro-Life asked me to go represent them at a national conference here and there. But it wasn't until 2016, with the rise of Donald Trump, um, that I became very compelled to do something within the community, to actually get on the ground and start to make a difference. because. Obviously, I'm a liberal. I don't agree with Donald Trump's policies. I certainly don't agree um, with most of the decisions that he's made as a president or the things that he platformed off of leading up to the presidency. But yet he's holding the opinion that I have. And I realize that there's absolutely no way that this message is going to reach the community, the Bay Area community, if we're relying on Trump to do it. Um, so in October of 2016, I launched Pro Life San Francisco, and if you would have told me then I'd be here today, I probably would have thought you were crazy, but here we are, and this is my story. So now I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the things that I learned when I connected with Secular Pro Life that really kind of solidified my viewpoint and gave me the confidence to go out and talk about it in public. So the first premise of the Secular Pro Life position, and I think that you might notice that while all of these arguments are secular arguments, they're the same arguments that religious people are using. It's just sometimes hard to notice that because all we see is the fact that they're religious, so we assume that they're making religious arguments, but these are all very um, science-based and uh, material pieces of evidence that are accessible to absolutely anyone regardless of whether or not they um, hold faith in God or any other entity. But the fetus is a human being. This is pretty uncontested. This is not, a, I'm not making a philosophical statement here. I'm just saying the fetus is a, a, a zygote, an embryo, a fetus. They are of our species. And they are whole unique from, and unique from the moment of conception. It's a, a fact of biology. It's something that we recreate in an IVF lab. We know the minute we have a brand new human organism. We have brand new DNA, unique to that human. We know what color eyes they're gonna have, what color hair they're gonna have, and lots of other traits about them, even in that embryonic stage. There is no other hallmark for individuality. We can't draw it back to any other moment except the moment we first exist. Um, but most of the philosophical debate is really around um, the second point of the prolate position, which is there's no consistent objective distinction between person and human being. And I think for the most part, people acknowledge, yes, okay, it's a human being, but for various reasons, it's not a person, and therefore we don't need to apply equal human rights to this human organism. And some people will draw that distinction around viability and say, well, you know, if you can't live outside um, someone's body on your own, then you don't really have human rights, and therefore we don't need justification in order to take your life. But that seems pretty arbitrary to most pro-lifers because viability is not something that's intrinsic to who we are or to the fetus. It's something that's based completely on where you are located geographically, where you happen to be gestating, and the technology available at that time. 
Viability, that the point of viability is constantly moving. It was once 28 weeks, which is still where the point of viability is in California. You can have a, an elective abortion in California up to 28 weeks of pregnancy. Um, but the um, British guidelines were just changed in October to 22 weeks. So we know at 22 weeks gestation, you have a very, very high likelihood of a fetus surviving if given medical care. So it seems kind of weird, right, that we would put human rights, uh, we, we would have someone's human rights based off of where they lo are located geographically and what technology is available. That just doesn't seem concrete enough. Um, pain capability. Um, uh, there are born people that cannot feel pain. They do not you lose their right to life just because they cannot feel pain. It's actually quite a horrible condition that they have to endure. Uh, and then a lot of people will draw uh, this distinction around consciousness or sentience. And consciousness, like the, the ability to really have like these human-like qualities, the things that kind of, I think in general, set us apart from other species, those cognitive abilities don't really happen until about 12 to 15 months after birth. And then some will draw a point of sentience. And, and this is, sentience is very difficult to define. It's very difficult to determine when it actually occurs. Um, but some people will say sometime around 24 weeks. Um, and I think that's a consistent position if you're an ethical vegan and you aren't taking the lives of any other creatures who have achieved that kind of uh, like level of cognitive ability. Um, so it's about being consistent and being objective and what we find is that, at least to this day in my advocacy, I have not found a consistent objective distinction between human being and person. And that is because they are the same thing from our point of view, from a pro-life perspective. The third point of the pro-life position is that human beings merit human rights. So if you don't believe in human rights, you're never going to get to the pro-life position because this is the cornerstone of it all. We're saying that your right to exist, your right to not be unjustly killed, is not grounded in something that you can do, in some kind of ability that you have, or something that you can contribute to society. We're all equal because we share something in common. And that one thing that we share is our humanity. There is nothing else. And this idea that we can conceptualize a human non-person is an idea that's been used a lot in history, it's been used exclusively to discriminate against whole groups of human beings who have been called non-persons. And this is actually a quote from uh, Dr. Mildred Jeff Jefferson. She was the first African-American woman to graduate from Harvard Med School. She was a staunch anti-abortion advocate. She um, supported anti-abortion efforts before and after Roe v. Wade, and she said, I'm not willing to stand aside and allow this concept of expendable human lives to turn this great land of ours into just another exclusive reservation where only the perfect, the privileged, and the planned have the right to live. She was actually uh, the first African-American woman to be the president of the National Right to Life Committee as well. A real hero for the pro-life movement. Now, in order to achieve this type of discrimination, because for the unborn, this discrimination is lethal almost 100% of the time. Abortion is also the number one cause of death in the United States, dwarfing deaths by uh, heart disease by like more than 400,000 per year. And this discrimination is allowed because we have done so much work as a culture to dehumanize the pre-born human. And this has happened in these other cases that I've talked about too. This amazing chart was made by Rehumanize International. We're gonna send you guys links to all this stuff um, so you can find this later, but if you wanna go to their website, this is there. And this, is, uh, there, this has been studied, the idea of dehumanization through language. And there are actual categories that have been used um, to dehumanize um, groups like African Americans, Native Americans, European Jews, elderly and disabled, refugees, enemy combatants, um, and incarcerated inmates, as well as pre-born humans. And those categories are to describe them as a non-person, an animal, an inanimate object, a deficient human, or a parasite. 
And I'm sure that you guys, you can look at the chart and you can see exactly, there, there are quotes from people, from specific um, points in history saying exactly those things about these groups. Um, and there is a perfect parallel between that and what is happening um, with abortion in America today and the way that we have dehumanized an entire population of human beings. But the debate on the ground is something different. And I think a lot of pro-lifers get kind of stuck here. They're like, well, I've shown you it's a human being, and I've shown you why it, it should have moral relevance to you. Uh, but that really sidesteps the main argument that's being made on the sidewalk, which is my body, my choice. This is about bodily autonomy, something that's very important in our society, something that uh, we have spent you know, decades uh, developing jurisprudence to protect bodily autonomy. And there's an important case um, that happened in 1978 um, where this guy, McFall, he had this like disease, I, I forget exactly what it was, but he needed a bone marrow transplant. And getting a bone marrow transplant is actually very difficult. And he found that his cousin, um, Shimp, was a match. And Shimp was terrified of going through with the surgery. He did not want to have to do this, and he refused. Um, and McFall, desperate to save his own life, he was in his 30s, and he had his whole life ahead of him. And, uh, but, so he sued Shimp uh, for his bone marrow. And the court was like, yeah, that's a really messed up thing that you're not helping your cousin, uh, but it would be even more messed up if we were going to say that the court is going to forcibly take your bone marrow from your body and give it to someone else to sustain their life. And so this very much solidifies how we understand bodily autonomy, that the right to someone else's life, the right for someone else to thrive, doesn't always come before someone else's right to have autonomy over their own body. And then there's another very famous um, pro-choice argument um, called The Violinist. It was written by Judith, Judith Jarvis Thompson back in the 1970s as well, big time for abortion. Um, but she explains a thought scenario where you're at a party, you're having the best time ever, probably drinking a little too much, you black out, you wake up, and you are like connected to this guy in this weird dialysis situation, and the doctor rolls in and he's like, uh, sorry about what's happening here, but it turns out the violinist, he's really famous and attractive, and we want to make sure that he lives, and you are a perfect match for whatever it is he has. All you have to do is stay connected to him for nine months, and then you're free to go, and everybody lives. And so obviously, it would be really, really cool of you to do that for the violinist, very nice. Um, but should you, be, should you be forced by law? Should you be compelled by the law to stay connected to this guy for nine months? And I think most people would agree, no, that's insane. But the distinction uh, that I find so compelling between this argument and pregnancy is that in this argument, you are kidnapped. You had absolutely no say in this situation, and therefore no responsibility in keeping a violinist alive. But in the vast majority of situations where pregnancy occurs, it's done through consensual sex. It's like if you showed up at the door for the party and they were like, hmm, you can totally come in, but there's like a 22% chance, up to a 22% chance, that you might get connected to this guy. And then, if that's the case, would you have the right to leave him? Would you have the right to kill him then? If you decided it after you've already consented to the risk that you didn't want to help him out, we might treat it differently, especially if it's happening 22% of the time we go to parties. Um, and same thing with the, or, or different though, with the car crash analogy. The car crash analogy is quite powerful because it says, you know, every day we get into our cars, well, I don't, I haven't driven in 13 years because I live in the city, but if you guys get in your cars every day, you do it of your own volition. No one's forcing you to do that. But if you crash into someone and you hurt them, even fatally, you are not compelled by law to donate blood to save their life. This is a powerful argument. But I think the distinction here between pregnancy is again the frequency. If we were getting into fatal car accidents, two to 22% of the time we drove, and the only person that could save the life of the person on the other side 
is you, I would think that as a society, we would come together and be like, hey, maybe there should be some responsibilities involved um, with this uh, car crash situation. And I think that that really shows me that this debate is not about bodily autonomy. It's about the fact that we do not perceive early humans, embryos, fetuses, as equal human beings to the rest of us. And we're likely doing that through some form of ableism. And even Roe versus Wade uh, said, quote, Appellant and some Amici argue that the woman's right is absolute and that she's entitled to terminate her pregnancy at whatever time, in whatever way, and for whatever reason she alone chooses. With this, we do not agree. In fact, it is not clear to us that the claim asserted by some Amici that one has an unlimited right to do with one's body as one pleases bears a close relationship to the right of privacy previously articulated in the court's decisions. The court has refused to recognize an unlimited right of this kind in the past. And I think it's also important, this is uh, Jane Roe here. She uh, was, she actually never did have an abortion. She um, gifted her child um, for adoption and she spent the rest of her life as a pro-life activist trying to undo uh, the case that bore her name, that has destroyed to this day uh, over 60 million American lives. So does abortion correct a social injustice, as many um, pro-choice advocates tell us? Or is abortion unjust, as pro-life advocates tell us? Well, I want you to look uh, at this chart. And I think one of the more compelling arguments coming from the pro-choice side is, you know, the lesser of two evils. We don't want to create a world where women or pregnant people are dying trying to procure abortions that they're not able to obtain legally. And there is a lot of rhetoric about, we will never go back. Um, and, and there's truth to that. People did die from illegal abortions prior to Roe v. Wade. So I'm wondering, looking at this chart, this is the number of women who died from illegal abortions. In your minds, can you pinpoint a place where you think uh, the Roe v. Wade decision happens. Usually I have somebody volunteer to come up, but we don't have time, so I'm just gonna have you pick that it. Where do you think it is? Well, it's actually right here. Not even a blip on the radar, and neither is the first state legalizing abortion. Um, so pro-choice advocates will often zoom right into this area and say, look, right after the Supreme Court decision, it just plummeted. But look at it in context, guys. We have no reason to believe that there's just going to be an outrageous number of maternal deaths um, if abortion isn't widely legally available. Not that it's not something that we don't have to seriously consider. We do. It's important. But it's also important to understand the truth. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who uh, performs thousands of abortions in the state of New York, who co-founded uh, NARAL, uh, then known as the National Abortion Rights Activist League, um, he after performing an abortion under ultrasound technology, um, became pro-life, he spent the rest of his life as a pro-life activist, um, and he wrote extensively how the numbers of maternal deaths prior to Roe v. Wade were exaggerated by factors of 40 in order to get uh, public support for Roe v. Wade. And these talking points of thousands of women dying every year before Roe these are coming from doctors who know better, from people in the abortion industry that know better. They're not accidentally saying these numbers. These are specifically chosen to manipulate the conversation. And while that is a very, very hard edge of the pro of the pro-life side, something that we have to own, something that we have to acknowledge and we have to constantly work to try to mitigate. But the pro-choice side must also come to terms with the hard edge of their side, and that is straight up infanticide. And if you think that I'm insane, I'm going to walk you through the evidence of this. Because quite frankly, it does sound insane, but this, this is America, guys. This is Kermit Gosnell. Uh, he is currently serving a life sentence um, for severing baby's spines with scissors um, as his general practice. Uh, and you can read actually the grand jury report on the things that he did. He uh, delivered likely tens 
of thousands of babies alive and then severed their spinal cords because, quite frankly, it's easier and nobody was checking on him. Peter Singer, someone that I admire very much, a, a, a teacher at a, a professor out of Princeton, he's a vegan, he cares deeply about social justice issues um, and about the poor. Um, and yet he believes that because infants do not have that cognition until about 12 to 15 months after birth, that there's really no issue with killing them before then. It's not really too morally problematic. And there have been several studies written on this. And then also we have the issue of fetal tissue research, which on the surface sounds like, okay, well that's cool. I mean, because if people are having abortions, we wanna make sure that the best can come out of that, and that if that means cures for diseases, we want that to happen. But let me explain to you how fetal tissue research works. Uh, for example, a contract um, that the NIH just canceled with UCSF that's been going on for at least the last uh, six or seven years requires a monthly supply of late-term fetuses for medical experimentation. They re that one project required two per month, they had to be between the ages of 18 and 24 weeks, meaning many of them were viable. And in order to do abortions for organ harvesting, for fetal tissue research, they cannot use digoxin, which is the lethal injection that causes fetal demise prior to an abortion. So without the use of digoxin, they can only do these late-term abortions two ways. One is through a live dismemberment, and the other is through a medical induction, and with, according to the Society of Family Planning, a pro-choice organization, a medically induced late-term abortion um, without the use of digoxin produces born alive infants up to 50% of the time. Five, zero, right there. And if that's not mainstream enough for you, in 2001, um, when the born alive, uh, Abortion, uh, Born Alive Infant Survivors Protection Act was introduced uh, that provides that a live child born as a result of an abortion shall be fully recognized as a human person and accorded immediate protection under the law. Obama said on the Senate floor in 01, whenever we define a pre-viable fetus as a person that is protected by the Equal Protection Clause, it would essentially bar abortions because the Equal Protection Clause does not allow somebody is this to kill a child, okay? So if we even protect infants born alive, it would essentially bar all abortions. And if that's not mainstream enough for you, everybody in, on this slide has at some point voted against the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act Bills that would not only offer protections for infants born alive after an abortion, but would actually have penalties attached to the doctors who let babies die and or kill them for medical research. This is our leadership. There have been 80 different unanimous consent requests to vote on the Born Alive Abortion Survivor Protection Act, and 80 different times Democrats have blocked that from happening. I'm a Democrat, I'm just saying. Are they representing you? So when we are weighing the hard edges of the abortion debate, I acknowledge that it is very important for us to consider that, that many women have come, and people who can get pregnant have come to rely on abortion. And that there may be some who seek abortion um, in cases where it's illegal that could die trying to access abortion, that's real, okay? But this is real too. And if you can't understand why accidental deaths that we're actively trying to prevent don't weigh quite as heavily to me as allowing the deliberate killing of literal babies born alive, well, that's just kind of where I land and I can't really explain it too much further. Um, I think that when we're talking about human rights violations, when we're talking about dehumanization, that is something that comes exclusively from a profit motive. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, but I just want to mention, you know, it's there. We're talking about $1 billion in assets and abortion bringing in 41% of the nation, nation's largest abortion providers, non-government money. So let's get into the politics. That's just the ethics and the science. 
Um, what about millennials? Why do we care about millennials? Well, millennials are the largest generation in the history of our country. We also make up the largest segment of the population today. We're the most secular generation. And as you can see, we're much more likely to be not religious than literally anything else. It is the largest of the, the religious groups for that age group. We're also the most LGBT identifying, and not just identifying, but poll after poll shows that LGBT issues matter deeply to millennials. We're also the most racially diverse and the most left-leaning. And a lot of people will say, oh yeah, well, you know, everybody who's young is like a liberal, but then when they get older, they're conservative. But the oldest of millennials are about to turn 40 very left-leaning and liberal ideology. So you might be extremely shocked to find out that poll after poll also tells us uh, that millennials have very complicated views on abortion, but they are more likely to oppose late-term abortion than their parents, and they're less likely to support abortion on demand than their parents. Okay, so that's a huge opportunity. We're talking about 60% of Democrats here uh, believe that Abortion should be limited at least to the first three months of pregnancy. And again, I showed you that slide of our democratic leadership that won't even protect infants born alive. So tell me again, are they representing us? And the political messaging that we see from the abortion industry is very much in tune with that reality. They know that millennials are everything in this fight and that the pro-life and conservative Christian side really sucks at reaching them. And so no, nothing up here is really about abortion. I mean, we're talking about police brutality, feminism, healthcare, LGBT issues, things that matter to millennials and just kind of roping it all in. So it's like, look, we're the ones on your side, right? We're the ones that support your beliefs about all of these other issues, so you should be also on our side about this other thing that we know you have very complicated feelings about. And then the confirmation bias, so strong, so hard to get past. I mentioned the Trump thing. Uh, this particular situation with this Covington kid uh, at the March for Life this year, um, him and a bunch of other uh, Caucasian kids standing around wearing MAGA hats, and uh, there was a confrontation with this Native American man, and the media just went all over it. They're like, these kids, they're blocking the way. They wouldn't let this Native American man through. These MAGA kids are awful. And I was like, yeah, they're awful, MAGA kids. Because I feel the same way. But all of our bias was triggered because once the video came out, everyone saw it was actually, the kids were just minding their own business and that it was the Native Americans that came in and actually uh, started the, the um, incident. So. This kid's actually suing um, the media now for like 200 and something million dollars uh, for defamation, but that's, it's not, it, of course it's about journalists not being responsible, but it's about the fact that we are all holding our own biases so strongly that it's so difficult to kind of get around it and see that some of the positions held by people that we very, very much oppose can, there can be some merit to them. And I don't want to trigger your cognitive dissonance too much and make you uncomfortable, but you know this is the pro-life movement that I exist in. These are the people that I hang out with, and these are the events and the messaging that we use. But you know, it's not—it doesn't fit the narrative, it, and it doesn't fit people's confirmation bias about what it means to be pro-life, right? And then there's also abortion in the Democratic Party. And you may be surprised to know, uh, it's been well documented in this book, Defenders of the Unborn, that the uh, beginnings of the pro-life movement were actually uh, very left-leaning. Uh, it was uh, a liberal effort uh, towards equality, nonviolence, and non-discrimination. And this was all prior to Roe v. Wade. Uh, Joe Biden was very pro-life, and it was actually uh, Nelson uh, Rockefeller who ushered in the very first um, abortion, a sweeping abortion rights laws in New York, and he was a Republican. Um, so it, it hadn't really separated in the way that we see it now today until after Roe v. Wade, when evangelicals decided they're against abortion, and the Republican Party was like, cool, uh, we can uh, 
yeah, we're gonna wrap that up. I'm gonna move faster. <laughs> okay, so people are always like hating sidewalk counts, uh, sidewalk counselors. People standing outside abortion facilities. We're just like the worst. I've done focus groups. I know it's like the abortion industry always gets like heart, heart, heart. And if you ask them about pro-life activism, it's like negative numbers. You're the scum of the earth. Um, we get it. That's what happens when um, when you try to rise up against. A, an oppressive institution. You have to do nonviolent direct action, and that means being there uh, for people who are being coerced. It means showing the community that we're not giving up on this issue, that it is serious to us, and we are committed to the values of equality, nonviolence, and non discrimination, and we are committed uh, to bringing to the surface the hidden tensions that already arise in this community on abortion that are not being heard and they're not being communicated, um, either especially on a political level. The um, pro-choice side will often represent us as violent. They'll talk about um, anti-choice violence and a history of anti-choice violence. Please understand every social justice uh, movement inspires violence sometimes, and it's not something we're for. We're for nonviolent direct action, but even Black Lives Matter, there was that shooting in Houston, and there's lots of other, um, oh, sorry, was it Houston, Robert? Yeah. Uh, and, Dallas. Sorry, Dallas, somewhere in Texas, far away from California. But still, it doesn't diminish the value of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's just that sometimes people can become radicalized um, from messages that are enraging to them. And a lot of people do feel very upset about the situation of abortion in America today. And these are just some examples of the violence that um, pro-lifers experience. Uh, Ron, my good friend, 86 years old, we've been out on the sidewalk many times together, he got beat up on camera last year. The guy told him to stay on the ground, old man, and literally beat him up. Uh, this guy kicked someone I know. Uh, that girl uh, got punched outside of a uh, clinic. Um, so this idea, like, I can't even tell you how many times I've been threatened with violence. Um, so it's not something that's specific to pro-choicers or pro-lifers. All I'm saying is take it with the understanding that we're fighting injustice here and that people do get inspired to do things that we do not support. This is a movement of nonviolence, non-discrimination, and equality. And so I'm gonna run through the public health. Thank you guys so much for giving me a little bit of time. Um, I wanna talk about how this affects the community. Um, because like I mentioned before, one in four people who can become pregnant uh, will have an abortion in their lifetime. And uh, many experience miscarriage. And many experience pain after an abortion. Now, the pro-choice pro people that go after me will most certainly show you studies saying most do not, that it's very uncommon for those types of things to happen. But they do happen. And those women's voices are being silenced in the abortion debate um, next to campaigns like Shout Your Abortion that seek to paint abortion as no big deal and empowering. And so then when you have uh, legislators saying things like, oh, a miscarriage is just some mess on a napkin. How is the community supposed to process um, this loss that they may be experiencing? Their loss is being marginalized um, by elective abortion in this country. And then there's a racial aspect to this as well. And I, I'm sure that um, the people that go after me will certainly be addressing this. And yes, abortion affects people of color at a much higher rate um, than white people. So does income inequality. It is a, abortion is a symptom of poverty, not a solution to it. We must find nonviolent solutions for the terrible situation that people of color experience in this country. It's real, it needs to be addressed, but we need nonviolent solutions. And then of course abortion coercion, uh, which is something that um, the pro-choice uh, lobby will say is quite rare, uh, but we know from their own statistics from Guttmacher that um, that 93 uh, percent uh, were sure of their decision to have an abortion. So only seven percent that weren't sure. And then we even have some uh, where it says two percent of cases women felt that they had been pushed to have an abortion against their wishes. So two percent of 60 million is something like 1.2 million coerced abortions in this country. So we need to really confront some of the harder edges of what it means to have pervasive abortion laws in this country. We are one of only seven nations that allows abortion up until birth. 
And I would say that if you want to challenge that, if you have uh, discomfort with late-term abortion and you feel that you're not being represented, then we have to challenge that because the law of the land at this point is Roe v. Wade, and Roe v. Wade allows abortion up until birth. So if you want to codify Roe, that is what you're saying. And if you want limits on a fleet of abortion, then we need to challenge Roe. Um, so I think that's pretty much, oh, we want to create a world that we can all agree is a great place to live. It's not a world where nobody has sex before the marriage, no one can access birth control. We need a shared vision of tomorrow. And we can't just count on religious conservatives to build that. We need all of us to, to help build that culture. And I, I think a lot of pro-choice people can help us with that. We want to ensure that there are protections and um, that there is support for people um, who are parenting. And that's the way that we're gonna build a better tomorrow. So thank you guys so much. Um, please, if you don't already hate me, follow us, and I'm um, happy to take questions now. Thank you so much. So the first one that we'll go with, um, regardless of what your personal opinion on abortion is, why should the federal or state government be allowed to determine a personal life-altering health care decision? I think if the government has a role in anything in America, it is to protect its citizens, and it is to enforce that protection equally, and not based on our abilities or our size, or any other arbitrary um, thing. That the government's one role, like even the most libertarian person who thinks, oh, you know, we, we shouldn't have any public money in anything, agrees with that. That that is the role, the one role of government. So I think it's fundamental. Uh, I definitely don't consider it a healthcare decision. I don't consider abortion either preventative uh, or restorative. I think the idea that it's restorative is actually pretty misogynistic to suggest that um, that being non-pregnant is like the more desirable thing to be. Like a, it's nor it's uh, making the male body normative. Um, so no, I don't consider it healthcare, and I, I don't. Con I definitely consider that if the government's going to get involved in anything, it better be protecting our lives from destruction. Um, <clears throat> the next question that we have is: as a pro-life advocate organization, what can be done, and what is being done for preventing unwanted pregnancies and supporting families with unwanted pregnancies? Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's really important, and that's something that has been debated a lot on both the pro-choice and the pro-life side. How, we, we see abortion numbers going down, um, so everybody wants to take credit for that, right? It's like abortion advocates are like, oh, it's because of birth control, and pro-lifers are like, it's because of pro-life pregnancy centers and pro-life laws. Um, we don't really know what's gonna help, but we think that doing a, just a, a little bit of everything is important. Um, I personally am very pro-birth control, I'm an atheist, you know, Secular Pro Life is a very pro-birth control organization, but in terms of community organizing, I'm organizing groups of people that have various views on birth control and abortion, or, so it's not like I'm out there handing out condoms or something, but I do think that sex education is important, I think it's important that we're getting sex education that's from someone who isn't selling future abortions, uh, I, I think that we should be relying on um, on vetted third party um, entities to teach se sex education. I think it's crucial. Um, in terms of preventing unplanned pregnancy as well, I mean, I, I think that I covered that, right? Yeah, okay, cool, next question. Um, right, this is the last one. Um, and this will require a trigger warning. Um, where do you stand on anti-abortion for women who um, became pregnant from non-consexual sex? Non-consensual sex. Uh, sorry to give you guys a trigger warning earlier. Actually, I meant to do that, but I get going and then sometimes I forget. So sorry if I say anything that was triggering. I meant to say trigger warning. You're, you're asking me about abortion in cases of rape. Mm -hmm. I personally um, do support a legal exception for cases of rape. I think the um, arguments for bodily autonomy are extremely uh, strong in cases of rape. Uh, do I think that it's okay? No, of course not. I think it's as wrong as Ship not giving McFall his blood, his bone marrow. I think that we should be willing to do the right thing for each other, but I don't think that there's any basis to legally force someone to carry pregnancy to term if their, bi if their bodily autonomy has been violated, uh, same as Ship and McFall. Um, so you're saying that for someone to get a legal abortion, they would have to prove to you that they had been raped? 
No, no one has to prove anything to me. I mean, it's, I'm not in charge of the world, first of all. It would be great, but that's not the way it goes. Um, I do not believe, I, I'm a strong believer in believe women. I think that women have been historically disbelieved, especially in, in terms of sexual assault. I do believe that we live in a rape culture. I believe that coercion is non-consensual. I believe you know, that there are lots of ways that um, someone's autonomy can be violated and, and therefore they wouldn't have a moral obligation or a legal obligation to carry to term. Um, do I know how that would all work out legally? No, uh, that's just my personal opinion. I think the arguments are too strong. Um, in those cases, but I don't think that it just is like, well, I don't know how the law would be, so therefore abortion for everyone for no reason. Um, and I also want to mention that pro life San Francisco does not take a stance on abortion in the case of rape because my personal position is not one that's shared by everyone in my group or my board or whatever. There's a lot of different um, views on that. So we want to make room for everybody um, in that space um, to talk about the issues. I think it's important that I stay open-minded in terms of you know where other people are coming up from and why they think that it, it shouldn't be legally permissible. Um, but that's where I stand now, and uh, as, like I said, the organization stands on control on that topic. Thank you. I thought you were going to be made Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. We'll give you all five minutes for a break. If you could come back after the break, um, we'll have our next presenters.